So the words machine learning evoke different reactions in people. Some people think it's really interesting. Others think it's kind of concerning that I guess non-biological things can learn. And some people think it's kind of like magic. But today I will be talking about how machine learning can be used as a tool to help us understand the world we live in. My name is Paulina and I will be presenting my project on predicting chemical reaction rates for planetary chemistry. My mentors for this were Dr. Cleves and Dr. Lonneville. So you're curious about exoplanets. I'm sure some of you have been here before. Um, and exoplanets are planets that are outside of our solar system and other solar systems. So you do a quick Google search for exoplanets and something like this comes up. And you read the first article and it says that a surprising number of exoplanets could host life. Now, before you get all excited that some exoplanets could host life, the skeptic in you says, wait, how can we make predictions about exoplanets? How can we know that these exoplanets can host life without really being able to visit them or with having such limited information about them? Well, the answer to that is scientific models. Scientists use models to interpret the data that they get and also explain the kinds of conditions that might be on planets that could explain their observations. So one of the most important kinds of models for exoplanets is atmospheric models, since atmospheres are one of the features that we can sometimes detect of exoplanets. But the problem is that these models heavily depend on the input data that we give them, and we don't always have all the data we may need. So in the atmospheric model example, we would need information about chemical reaction rates or how fast species react. So the reactions that we can measure on Earth are finite, and also exoplanets might just have unusual reactions that we can't measure here or that we simply haven't thought of measuring because they're not applicable to anything we've seen before. So my project is a sort of solution to this data problem and it is to predict reaction rate constants using machine learning. Now, this isn't a replacement for actual data, but these predicted or estimated constants can help point us in the right direction of what might be worth looking into more. So this might sound kind of complicated, so I'll break it down. First, we use reaction rates that we know, and then we give those to an algorithm to predict reaction rates that we do not know. Let's start with the first part, using reaction rates that we know. So for this part of the project, we use an atmospheric chemical reaction data set called STAN 2019. And because the model heavily depends on what kind of data we give it, so it, it will be better at predicting things that it has seen before, we wanted to figure out what is really in the data set that we're basing our algorithm on. So there are 6,000 reactions. Um, there are 11 different types of elements. And on the right, you can see a chart with the elements on the x-axis and their frequency on the y-axis. So the data set is heavily geared towards hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. And the data set also has reactants, products, variables for calculating the rate constant, and reaction flags, which are types, basically says what type the reaction is. Then we wanted to add some more useful features to the data. Features are information about each reaction that we can add using our knowledge from chemistry or just intuition. So here's an example reaction. You have C and H, CH then breaks down into carbon and hydrogen. So one thing you might notice is that there are carbon and hydrogen in this reaction or that there is one reactant and two products. So those kinds of things are features. And we came up with as many as we could, and we turned them all into numbers so that the algorithm can read those features and use them to make its predictions. OK, but how are these features used? So for that, we'll explain training and testing. So the whole data set is split up into two portions, a training set, which is typically larger, and a testing set, which is smaller. So in the training set, the algorithm sees both the features and the constants. So the features you can think of as inputs and the constants are the related outputs. Then for the testing set, the algorithm only sees the features and then it predicts constants based on those features. So then we look at the predictions and the actual values that we have and that tells us how good our algorithm is. You can think of it as sort of training for running a race. So you would train here 
and you would build muscle mass and become good at running, but then you would compete and use those muscles and skills that you built to see how good you actually are. Okay, but then how does this help with prediction? For that, I'll explain decision trees. Now, I know there's only one correct answer to the question, should I attend BooSicon? But bear with me just for right now. So a decision tree is something that you probably do in your head all the time. It's a way of making a decision. You start off with a central question and then you break it down into different groups based on other information. So the first question you might ask yourself is, do I like science? And then this turns into sort of a binarized decision, yes or no. Yes, you should attend, and no, you might ask yourself a different question. So the algorithm I use works in the same way, except for it doesn't split by questions such as, do I like science, but it splits the, the data into more of a machine version, such as, is this column less than or equal to this value? So the values and the splits um, are selected by random which is actually what makes this algorithm good. So the algorithm generates many of these trees, as many as we want it to, um, and it does this using the training set. Then it runs the testing set through all these trees and averages the values from each tree to create the final prediction. Now each individual tree is flawed because obviously it is split randomly, but because we use different trees and each tree is randomly incorrect, the, as theory goes, the incorrectness sort of cancels each other out and we end up with predictions that can be actually pretty good. So using this method, we so far have some preliminary results. So our results are that the algorithm works better than just using the mean of the data to predict a rate constant, but there's still room for improvement. So in case you're wondering what an output from the algorithm might look like, this is a sort of nicer version. We use two different metrics to measure how good our predictions are. One is root mean squared error, and the other one is an R squared value. So we run the training set through the algorithm and also the testing set through the algorithm. So the important thing to note about the root mean squared error is that we want it to be as low as possible. So here we see that it's lower for the training set for, than for the testing set, which is expected, but we do want it to be a bit better for the testing set because if, it's, if it relies too heavily on the training set, then it just might not be good at predicting the reaction rates for reactions it hasn't seen yet, and then it's not that useful for us. And also, the, the other metric is the R squared value, and we want to be as close to one as possible. And there's quite a big, bigger difference here. So for the training set, the R squared value is almost one, but for the testing set, it's like 0.75, which means that we can do a bit better in terms of having the training set be more representative of the testing set. So the next steps are to adjust the parameters of the algorithm to make it better continue splitting the training and testing sets differently so that our predictions become more accurate and ultimately apply this method to outside data to help us understand planetary processes. I'd like to thank my mentors and also Dr. Rimmer from University of Cambridge for helping us understand the STAN 2019 data set, which is the data set that we ultimately use. Thank you for listening and I'll take questions if you have any. Thank you, Paulina. Any questions? Are we allowed to just jump in? Yeah. Hey, Chris. Uh, hi, Sandra. How are you doing? Uh, I really like that, Paulina. Um, that's nice work. Uh, I could ask you a billion questions about this because I've been thinking along the same lines recently. But uh, I was just curious. Um, in terms of, are, are you going more or less basically on uh, a direct template, a direct templating approach to encoding the prior reactions, or are you trying to uh, embed atomic properties around the reaction somehow to allow prediction across unknown chemistries more? I guess I, I either missed that part or I'm just curious, like, how you're taking the abstraction approach. In there. Um, I'm not really sure what you're asking. Could you repeat that? 
Sure, I, it's it's three or it's four a.m. here, I guess. So I'm probably not <laughs> asking it in the most clear fashion either. Um, so in in terms of being able to say abstract from carbon chemistry where we may have a lot of it to nitrogen chemistry where we may have less, we could embed properties like atomic electronegativity, valence state, things like that or you can abstract around other bonding patterns and features. And so I just wondered what the, what the data embedding was and any strategy you had for generalizing it uh, so that you could abstract outward from the database. So I guess so far um, we've just started, we, the, I guess the next step is to start using the smile strings that we've, um, I guess, created for the data set. And then since those contain a lot of the information that I think you mentioned, then those then that information can then be added as features. But so far we've just been using um, information that isn't in smiles. So like mass and number of reactants, number of products, that sort of thing. Does that answer your question or did I miss it? <laughs> no, that, that absolutely answers the question. That, that helps me understand where you're at with it. Um, that's, uh, that's a cool project. I'd love to talk to you about it some more sometime. Uh, now is not the best venue, probably, but uh, really cool. <laughs> yeah, sure. Well, it's not 4 a.m. for you, <laughs> probably. <laughs> <laughs> and when there aren't a bunch of bored people listening to me ramble. <laughs> All right. Thank you. <laughs>